Good evening. Um, thank you so much for coming. And I just wanted to also thank everyone for your patience as we have a very full house tonight. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, and we hope you enjoy it. Um, good evening and welcome to Strand Bookstore, the 84-year-old home of 18 miles of new, used, and rare books. I'm Alexandra Wilder, events director, and I'm very pleased to welcome artist Francesco Clemente here this evening, um, joined in conversation with author Salman Rushdie. Francesco Clemente, made in India, is the artist's love letter to the country. It compiles hundreds of drawings, collages, and notebooks made over the past few decades and includes a 1992 conversation between Clemente and poets Allen Ginsberg and Peter Orlovsky. Expanding on the influence of Indian culture upon Western art and literature in recent decades. Francesco Clemente was born in Naples, Italy. After studying classical languages, literature, and architecture, he turned to art in the 1970s. Clemente has been the subject of many major solo exhibitions, including several international traveling retrospectives. He is also famed for his many collaborations with artists such as Jean-Michel Basquiat and Andy Warhol, and with poets such as Allen Ginsberg and Robert Creeley. Although he has spent a great deal, of, great deal of time living and working in India, he has made New York City his primary residence since 1981. Salman Rushdie's novels include Midnight's Children, for which he won the Booker Prize and the Booker of Bookers, The Satanic Verses, for which he won the Whitbread Book Award, The Moor's Last Sigh, for which he again won the Whitbread Book Award, and Luca and the Fire of Life. In 2007, the British Crown appointed him a Knight Bachelor for Services to Literature. He is chairman of the Pan World Voices Festival and lives in New York City. Following their conversation, I'll pass around a microphone so we can take questions from the audience, um, and then we'll have a book signing. Please join me in welcoming Francesco Clemente and Salman Rushdie to the strand. All right. We're not allowed to sit back, because although the chairs are comfortable, we have to sit forward to speak into the microphones. That's why we're going to look like this for the next hour. <laughs> um, so, Francesco, Francesco's Made in India, which I hope you will all buy, is, a, is an extraordinary account of a long, very long relationship from when Francesco was very young right up to the present day with India as a place, with India as a storehouse of visual imagery, with India as a storehouse of symbolism and, and ideas and so on. And we'll try and get him to talk a little about this. Francesco has a bad habit of giving very short answers. So, <laughs> so I'm going to insist that he gives long answers. Um, let's just a little, little bit of the, at the beginning. Um, I mean, it said there's a interesting, the first essay in here talks about Francesco, how in the beginning when you were influenced by Arte Povera and by Boetti and so on, and then there's a, there's a moment when you moved away from that. And, and that seems also to be, roughly speaking, the moment when you first disappeared from Europe and ran away to India, away from all the mandarins of Arte Povera who were after your blood. Um, and then in India, I mean, let's put it this way, why India in the beginning? Why not yes. America? Why not somewhere else? Is this working? No? no. 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 <laughs> this one's working. Let's see. Try again. Is it working now? No. no. Is there a button? No. <laughs> I don't know where it is. That's not good. His microphone is the one that should work. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, just start talking with this. Move it back and forth. Okay. We'll just move it back and forth. Okay. Um. My, 
my impulse to um, to travel uh, was actually due to a wider discontent than discontent with the um, what I saw in the um, art world. I, I was just um, looking for more. Uh, I was just um, at uh, in conflict with the narrative of history as such, if one can say that, and I wanted to escape from history into geography. Uh, why India? Um, maybe for a very simple generational thing that a lot of my friends were, were at that point in time traveling to India, um, also driven by the same discontent with the narrative that we were, be, uh, we were being given. Uh, what happened to me when I went to India, though, was that I did not fall in love with the colorful India, but I fell in love really with the um, urban India. I didn't, I didn't go to the countryside. I fell in love with the, with at that time, socialist India, with the India that was filled with uh, extremely um, gifted and poetic people who were stuck in very simple and. Uh, non-artistic jobs and had plenty of time to talk about life and death and all of, of those things. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things I think is very interesting about what you found in India in terms of a, an artistic vocabulary is something quite similar to what the same generation of Indian artists was trying to find. And I know you have an ad admiration, as I do, for Indian artists like Bhupen Kakar. Now, one of the things that had happened in Indian art was that there was a problem for Indian artists of both the to be overly influenced by the West and also to be overly influenced by the Indian tradition. So, so you would have the generation of artists sort of older than ourselves, the Hussein, Souza, Gaitonde, um, those artists were extremely influenced by Western modernism and their works became, so at their worst, they became mimicries of Western modernism. And the alternative to that was that people would fall into an almost folkloric reaction backwards towards the world of the Mughal miniature and, the, and, and you know, the, the kind of glorious tradition of Indian classical painting. And how to find a contemporary language was, was a very big problem for Indian artists, I think, of your generation. And it's interesting that the best of them came to a similar conclusion to you, which is to look at the visual, what was available visually in the Indian street. You know, that it became not, you know, that it was like painted trucks and shop fronts and um, uh, movie posters and things like that, that began to provide a lexicon for a contemporary Indian art. And I mean, I think it's very interesting that a lot of these pictures go in that same direction. Uh, to what extent did you have any contact with Indian artists when you began to work there? Um, w w yes. W w w I, um, what happened when, when I say I fell in love with urban India, I should qualify that statement in the sense that um, I think the whole history of India is um, um, really centered into a relation between rural and urban and between a conflict but also a mutual sort of fertilizing each other, the world of the village and the world of the city. And so uh, the city in India at that time was also the filter for all of this uh, tradition that that from the villages took over the the, the city street and contam were, were contaminated by the city life and so you would have this just stunning um, contrast all all of all the time this visual visually stunning contrast 
for example, the um, Rajasthani peasant um, dressed in full regalia, in silver and ivory and colorful dress, working as a street um, cobbler. You know, they were making the actual the, the pavement of the streets. So there was always this conflict and discrepancy between gesture and 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 dress and. Um, or again, what the, uh, Salman was mentioning, the tracks painted by the village painters. Um, all of this um, talked to me, but the reason it talked to me is because um, coming from Italy, where I was living a sense of what, uh, I felt it was imposed to me, a, cer a certain narrative of what contemporary was, I found a place which was also contemporary and had the same vitality and the same drive as what I knew of the West, but in completely alternative terms. And so in this distance, I thought I would find the, the room and the space for me to um, uh, to articulate my own language. I was hoping that being suspended between one belief system and another belief system, one language and another language, I could find room for my own uh, um, language that would not be just an articulation of something that was already there, that would not be a reaction to something that was already there. This to me was vital to um, articulate a language that was not based on conflict or on power. I, I wanted um, to own my own roots and to grow out of my own roots, not to take someone else's space, but just to create my own. Well, that makes me think that one of the things that you have done always, a lot in this period, but also in the rest of your work, is to use the self-portrait as a way into the subject. I mean, so there's an extraordinary diversity of self-portraiture here, and uh, I wondered if you just want to say a little bit about what it was that made that so so much a recurring theme in your way, when you're exploring this, the Indian subject here. Well, <clears throat> it, it has a relation with, again, with the idea of finding a place in between. And um, just as I was looking for a place in between cultures, I was also looking for a place in between identities. And this is actually an Eastern, uh, not a Hindu, is a Buddhist notion, but the notion of bardo is, bardo is the gap. Uh, Bar Bardo is not, I mean, commonly it, uh, we hear uh, um, talking about Bardo as the state between lives, between, you know, after death and before the next life. But actually Bardo is the, the weave, uh, the, the, the articulation of life as we know it, and is made of all the gaps where we, for where we forget to be who we are, all the spaces in between, all the... Um, constantly um, um, renewing identities that we go through. So to me the self-portrait was a sort of an homage to this idea of Bardo, to the idea of the self, not as a mechanical um, linear narrative, but as the self as a void. But uh, is it a void? But the self also is very metamorphic. You know, the self, the, the image of the self is in these pictures is constantly transformed, sometimes even transformed by gender. The idea of metamorphosis is very important mm. in the work, and uh, what better place than India to engage in a reflection on metamorphosis? Um, the this is this is a Hindu idea that comes from yoga ideas. It says when when in the Hindu tradition they say everything is real, everything is changing. This is a, a, a enthusiastic acceptance of the fact that we are subjected to a constant metamorphosis. Our identities, our bodies, um, our perceptions are always, always, always flowing, and. Um, this is what I wanted to mimic with the work. I wanted to mimic this flow that um, 
of course, this is a notion that has been there from the beginning of time, and it is a notion that helps to um, bridge our place with, you know, I guess. But it's interesting, you know, that in in Western culture before Freud, the idea of the self was conceived of as unitary. You know, you were the self was that was what it was. It was a fixed thing, and and you explored that. And and a lot of, for instance, in literature, a lot of the the, tr the great nineteenth century tradition of the realist novel is based on that idea of the self being fixed and explorable, but constant. You know, but. And after Freud, we begin to get this idea of the self fragmenting and, and, being, and being contradictory and, and multiple, etc. But in India, as you say, that idea has been there always. You know? um, and uh, so this kind of post-Freudian Western idea you find in ancient Indian imagery. And even so, I suppose we should talk about, because it's so important in your work, the, um, the, the spiritual metaphysical side of this. So, you know, the, if, the incarnations of Vishnu, for example, you know that the idea of even even the god is metamorphic, and and can be um, sometimes human, sometimes a bull, etc. So, how consciously did you study that, or was it just that it was around you? Oh no, I I, I, um, I started from the best possible place that was in uh, a place of complete ignorance. I mean, I landed in uh, Delhi without knowing anything about any of these traditions or anything about what I was, ex you know, going to meet. Um, but I did, I did know, I was very young, I was 19 years old, I didn't know that I wanted to be a painter. And what a better place to be a painter than a place which for the last 5,000 years have been reflecting on the idea of the self as a witness. So the self as an I. Um, that is really the condition of the painter to reduce your um, activities really to witnessing without judging, without interpreting, without manipulating reality, if not through your perception. Um, so India has been really my school. But the, the, how much of the religious iconography was useful to you? Um, Whether Buddhist or Hindu? Yes. Everything was useful to me, in, not in literal terms, but in terms of, you know, I, always, I was very aware of being, an, uh, being a painter, being an artist, and so I was aware also that all of these deities had been invented by someone. They hadn't been sitting there from the beginning of time. Somebody had actually seen Ganesh, Shiva for the first time, and I was just asking myself, how did they do that? What kind of activities, how, what kind of uh, training, what kind of discipline do you need to develop to actually um, generate these icons that then everybody else can embrace, relate to, um, icons that become more than icons because then they become tools for contemplative practices and these contemplative practices affect the sense of self that people have. These were all the questions I was asking myself. But you were always, I think, seems to me, as an artist, unusually interested in narrative and story. And, you know, and, and, uh, and maybe that was not true of the <coughs> Western world of contemporary art that you came from. Absolutely, and this this um, deviance from the narrative of, of Western art is is actually growing as I as I grow older because uh, um, um, I've never accepted the exclusive idea of Western world in general, and so Western art in particular. I've always um, felt an, af activity, uh, an affinity for uh, an inclusive point of view. And actually, in, in maybe in poetry, you find that more. But mm. definitely, um, Western art is much more about reduction and exclusion than inclusion. Mm. Um, or has been so. Or, in yeah, the, or in it the has last been 60, so in the years. last yeah, in mm. the last hundred years.
Because you couldn't say that about the Renaissance, you know. I mean, well, no, uh, yes, we are talking uh, about uh, um, the world we know, not, yeah. not the past. And so when you went to India and began to work there, were there other artists that you visited their studios or that you were... Yes, no, I, I skipped your question no. uh, earlier. Yeah. Um, so I'm asking it again. And, um, and the, the answer is no. no. I, I had no interest uh, in that at all. Mm -hmm. I was really... Um, I mean, I, I do regret, for example, not to have met Boob and Kaker, but on the other end, I was really on, on a very sort of fanatical mission mm. of, of um, isolation, of uh, isolating myself from yeah. a context. I wasn't looking yeah. for another context. I was looking for an absence of context to um, imagining that in that absence something could be born. Mm. A lot of these pictures, particularly the ones you did in your first visits when you were younger, a lot of them are very small. So the, 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 there's like an enormous profusion of very small images, um, almost like sketch, like a sketchbook, you know, as if you're as if you're just trying to describe the world at speed in many, many hundreds, dozens of images, you know. And uh, is that what you felt you were doing? And why why the smallness of the image? I w I wonder. Um Something that happened to me in India that still happens sometimes when I'm there, I really find myself standing somewhere and living in what in Latin would be called subspecie eternitatis, like the, the eternal steps into the landscape. There is something really overwhelming um, and larger than than the oneself and then the narrative of man and so on, and in a way, this uh, this um, small formats and they're small. I would call them small and loving formats. Mm. Maybe they're an answer to that. Maybe mm. at a certain point, one looks at the eternal and says, you know, the eternal is great, but really, can't we just be transient, you know, comfortable and yeah. sweet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is something that wouldn't occur to me in a different, more harder contest, mm. you know? Huh. I would not do that. I would, I would look for something else. And then there's a moment, which is a little later chronologically, when you actually deliberately begin to take on this, the, the, the Indian miniature. So, so you actually begin to make yes. very modern versions but <clears throat> using a lot of the, the language of the miniature. Well, because my, my attitude was that already before, uh, you know, even if I was not in India, my attitude as an artist was that in a way I wanted, I wanted to impersonate all these uh, techniques and, um, you know, an artist in our time does not belong to, um, um, there is no craft anymore, there is no common narrative anymore. So an artist has to invent his own craft, has to invent his own narrative. And in my case, I did not want to invent a new stylistic solution or um, a new craft. I rather thought I would impersonate in each new group of work a different identity, a different artist, a different craft. So the extension of that attitude is that finding myself in India and noticing how there were all these extraordinary traditions of miniature making mm. or um, there were all these poster painters who were making paintings for the uh, film industry and I noticed how their patronage was very, you know, basically they were all working for uh, the tourist trade or for the street audience and I thought I could step in and collaborate with them and um, sort of um, enhance the rules mm. of the game, you know, that they would have actually more time and more direction mm. to um, create something, um, you know, with a well, different depth. So that's what I did. I collaborated in Rajasthan and in Orissa with miniature painters. Yeah, yeah. It's a collaborative effort anyway. It's not that I stepped into something that wasn't there. 
in in principle there is always a director just like in renaissance time there is a sort of more intellectualized uh, member of the shop who directs the mm -hmm. works mm -hmm. and then there are different skills each one of the painters has a different skill somebody exactly do, like in somebody renaissance somebody will do landscape somebody will someone, do architecture not even uh, something mm -hmm. as elaborate as a landscape someone no, do, does the rocks the flower another mm -hmm. one the flowers another one the animals yes. another yes. clouds everyone yeah clouds water, water. Mm -hmm. everyone yes. specializes mm -hmm. in one mm -hmm. element mm -hmm. and i was fascinated by mm -hmm. the process of course mm -hmm. <coughs> i wondered how many of the other if you like the kind of low art traditions, the kind of folk art traditions of India, were interesting to you. Like, I mean, I think Kalighat painting—it's pretty obvious. Yes, huh? um, I, in fact, I, I saw my first Kalighat um, drawing with Stella Gramsci. She is also mm. a contributor. There is a text also mm. by Stella mm. in this book. She was the great scholar for Indian art, and she mm. showed me some Kalighat drawings for the first time. Um, and again, I was just fascinated by the rigor and mm. uh, and concision of these works and by the simple story that these painters are sitting on the steps of the river making paintings for the passerby so this this combination of high skill um and um you know this offhand attitude fascinated yeah. me yeah. Also, you know but any of the others i mean for instance mm. uh the, the other big folk art traditions like Madhubani painting or Warli painting or any of those other, some of them have wall forms, you know, that they don't, they don't actually even happen on paper or canvas. I uh, learned oh. about all of that mm. much later. Mm. In fact, through the other contributor of the book, Jaitendra Jain, who uh, is the editor of the book, who uh, was the director of a craft museum in Delhi and he was uh, bringing from the rural parts of India from the villages he was bringing all these artists into the city and uh, allowed them to work into the city so I learned about all of these artists mm. only mm. later Later. in the early days I was just traveling alone across India it's such a huge complex <laughs> place you don't come across all of these I things I wanted to ask about place because you say you arrived in Delhi first um, I'm a Bombay boy so arriving in Delhi is the wrong place to arrive <laughs> Um, Delhi, ugh. Um, but where did you, they, did, was that, was it Delhi where in your first trip were you there, mostly there, or did you go to Banaras or Madras where you spent time afterwards? Um, uh, um, well, I arrived to Delhi because I was a messenger, I was bringing a translation, I had, I had a friend who was a translator, mm. and he was translating a, a book of conversations of a holy man who lived in Delhi. Mm. So um, I was carrying with me this translation, and I ended, I ended up um, as being a guest of this holy man who was not one of the what you see now with the, the billion followers and some giant establishment. It was the, we living incredibly modestly in a tiny slum, basically near mm. Kashmiri Gate mm. in Delhi. So my view of Delhi is kind of unusual. Mm. And um, after that, I traveled through Manali Valley. I went to the mountains. And then the trip after that, I went with my wife Alba, and we went to Benares for the first time, which remains one of my and you, you You go back there. I mean, you still yeah, where mm. I go back. Mm. And we went south. And then south became really our place in uh, Madras, Chennai, which is where we spent all yeah. of the years after that. And you were staying at the Theosophical Society? Yes, back uh, then. Uh, I don't know, many of you are familiar with the history of the Theosophical so Society with J. Krishnamurti. These are all things that happened at the turn of the century. Uh, a number of people objected to the modern modernist narrative and, you know, to the secular, secularization of the world. And they all thought they could somehow um, open a new door on contemplative traditions. So you had people like Rudolf Steiner and, mm. and you know, started the anthroposophical moment, uh, movement. And you had people like uh, Ledbetter and Besant who started the Theosophical movement with the idea of finding a new messiah for our time, who would sort of uh, um, uh, gather the truths that belong to all the different traditions and, and turn them into one 
acceptable contemporary truth. Mm -hmm. And um, so th this particular movement, the Theosophical movement, they had a wonderful garden and compound in Madras yeah. um, filled with extremely eccentric survivors of these years of the 20s and 30s. People were gone there in the 20s and 30s and never left this garden. Um, <laughs> it was quite a schooling, that one too. I mean, you know, people wouldn't look at you, they would look at your aura and, and you know. Um, it's a very beautiful garden though. Full a very big, beautiful big garden and, and at the center of the garden there is the oldest Bamiyan tree in mm. India mm. that was already recorded in the 16th century by some famous Chinese uh, traveler mm. writer. Mm. So this was where I did my reading because they also had a library of um, mystical literature yeah, yeah. and uh, both Eastern yeah. and Western yeah. because the um, one of the founders, um, uh, Annie Besant, she thought she was a reincarnation of Giordano Bruno. So, the, you know, I could go from yeah. Giordano Bruno to Plotinus to mm. the Bhagavad Gita. I just, I think before we let the audience ask a few questions, I just wanted finally, since we've got to the Bhagavad Gita and so on, to talk about a little bit more about mythology, because there's, a, there's somebody in here quotes you as saying, uh, that the gods who left us in Naples were still there in India. Um, what did you mean by that? And what, what, were, the, what were the, I mean, were there particular divine narratives that, that captured your imagination? Well, um, I grew up in Naples, which somehow is uh, one of the, I, I think, I think I, probably the only city where the, the street uh, the grid of the streets is still the grid from antiquity in the historic center of town. Um, and where each one of the churches is built over an ancient temple and somehow where a lot of narratives from the pagan universe are still alive, even if translated into, you know, into Christian um, uh, costumes. Um, so I do come from a, from some kind of pagan, some kind of polytheistic, pantheistic yeah, pagan well, yeah. background, and um, I always um, thought about that uh, quote by Pound, who said he liked Ovidius because he talked to the god like they were his relatives. So. I, I always had a fascination with uh, that type of attitude where you don't um, you you allow yourself familiarity with uh, something larger than you. Mm. But uh, if I fell in love with the narrative, yes, I fell in love with um, mainly with all the narratives related to Shiva, mm. who is the iconoclastic. God is the, is the God who breaks all the rules, um, and is also the God who um, is capable to reconcile uh, contemplation, sexuality, uh, female, male, um, all the opposite polarities. He can somehow reconcile, and all the rules he can establish and break. Hmm. Creator and destroyer, and is the destroyer. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, just one final question about m materials. You know, the beginning of this, you talk about being attracted to pastel as a way of reacting to what you were seeing, and then later on, there's a, this profusion of watercolor that comes in. Um, and I think you know, I mean, you've always been an amazing watercolorist, and here it seems to me is the beginnings of that. And I just wondered if you wanted to say a little bit about what it was about pastel, what it was about watercolor, that, mm. that you made you use them so much. Yes, the, the, the pastels to me were, uh, I think, relate to the... Um, everything is incredibly worn out in India, the, all the surf, there is never a surface that is intact. Every surface has been somehow um, 
warm and and ground and and so the pastels translate that feeling of something that is slowly dissipating mm. and um, I think I at the beginning I had the reluctance to um, use the watercolors because I had the reluctance to go too close to all of this um, folkloric traditions mm. and so on but then um, um, I finally embrace watercolors in in a, using them in a sort of non-orthodox way, which is uh, saturating the color a lot. And mm. this really is a response, not so much to what I saw in the streets, but really to Indian art, where you do see these these bashes, this special, especially all the material that relates to tantric traditions, to um, uh, they, where you see this color that is really saturates the the paper to a degree that you have never seen mm -hmm. elsewhere. Mm. Okay, well, let's. Uh, we have about ten minutes or so for you guys to ask questions. I think there's a. Where is the roving microphone? It's back there. So if if you want to, it would actually help. I think if you would just stand up because then we could see you and the microphone could come to you. Um, Hello? Hello? Yes. Where is it? I can't see. Let's see. Okay. Is that not working? That's not working. <laughs> Hello. Anyway, I'm going to... I'll try and repeat. All right. Anybody got a question? You could stick an arm in the air. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I was in India in 1990 as an ethnographer and a poet, and after a month in northern India and northern Pakistan, I looked at books of photographs and paintings, and I, my immediate reaction was they were all lies for the tourist industry. And then I looked at local artists' work, and I had the same reaction. And what I realized was, is that something to me, that to me as an outsider, was very distinctive about India and Pakistan was the mixture of smells. And so <laughs> what arose to me was what I call the problem with smell in visual art. <laughs> so I wondered if, <laughs> since you're laughing, it sounds like this may have been an issue that has arisen for you. No, no, it's a very smelly place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it at all something that comes up for visual artists as when trying to represent any concept of India? Well, I, I'm laughing because I agree with you. I mean, the, the distinctive, um, the most distinctive experience is the, the smell. And in fact, one of the great books about India is by Pasolini, the Italian poet, and he called the book L'odore dell'India, the smell of India. And in, in his case, the, is the smell of the funeral pyres of the smoke in Varanasi. So I agree with you. Um, I guess um, there is also this wonderful notion in, uh, in the Hindu tradition of rasa, uh, rather being really taste, but taste in the physical t is, is actually wonderful to remember that the word taste means when you eat something, you taste it. So, and in the in Sanskrit, rasa has the meaning, the flavor of of a music, the flavor of a poem. Um, so maybe rasa is the bridge to smell. I don't know. <laughs> It's a good question. Um, anyone else? Okay, I have a microphone back here. Oh, good. So I'll try to pass it to you if possible. Yes. Okay. Let's pass this along. Thank I liked when you were talking about um, the bardo, the gap, um, in, in response to your question about self portrait. And um, there is something about India, traditionally, India always had a place for realization of the self with the capital S as opposed to the self with the small S. 
Perhaps not a lot of people were interested in doing it, but nevertheless, it is a long-standing tradition in India, and it isn't so much in the West. And I was wondering about, you know, an argument, can't an argument be made for an artist in creating or a writer in writing um, that when you're actually out, stepping out of, your small S is stepping out of the way, it allows the large capital S and self to come into play. And in a sense, when you're making a piece, that in, it is a moment or something of realization. Um, do, do you follow what I'm saying? Uh, it, it, it very much interests me, and I, and I feel the self-portrait is an interesting um, concept because this, the, the S with the small S and the S with the capital S can come into play. It can, I, don't, I don't know if I'm being clear, but... Um, I think definitely there is a relation between contemplative practices and artistic practices. Um, I think when you say a moment of realization, I imagine is a moment where you don't gain anything. When you do something, you're always gaining. So there is a difference. I see, thank you. Yeah. Somebody over here, yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I actually stumbled in here tonight to buy a used copy of one of your books, Mr. Rushdie, and I was really surprised and delighted to find that you'd be interviewing Mr. Clemente. So thank you for calling on me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I want to ask for a person who has such an affinity to India, who's traveled to so many different interesting places in the world, why choose New York City as your primary home? <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> Well, in a way, I think places also choose us rather than we choose them. So um, I think in India I've learned to to accept the life I'm given, and I've been given a life in New York. I'm accepting it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, dodge the question. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, over here. Yes, sir. Just back here. In the middle. Sure. Hi. Um, Francesco, you said you left Italy because you were um, a little bit fed up with the history and you were trying to go through um, searching for a, a geography, a new geography. But uh, when you arrived in India, uh, didn't you uh, encounter another uh, history or many histories as well? I mean, didn't you encounter Alexander the Great and the Persians and the Tamils and the Portuguese and the French and the English and the British Raj or and you know all those traditions and the religions and that mix? What was your what was how did that impact you or were you? watching through another prism. I don't believe I was an Orientalist. I don't believe I had a romanticized view of, uh, of India. And um, when I say uh, escaping from history, I mean escaping from an history that wanted me to play a certain role, which I didn't want to play. So, um, well, when you, when you, for instance, made yeah. this work in Pondicherry, was there, I mean, that being a former French colony and so on, is that anything yeah, to do with but it? I, honestly, yes, there are all these um, events have happened, but. Frankly, I, I have a great admiration for the Hindu mind and the way it absorbs 
everything like no other mind, honestly. And I was fascinated with that too. And I, mean, I think it's banal to say, oh, well, in India there are not really any histories, which is a fact. I mean, there aren't any histories comparable to what we had from the beginning of time, you know, in Herodotus or that kind of chronicles. That has never been, there's never been any interest in it. Because the, result, the main effort has always been to be in the present. It's a collective effort to embrace the present with the idea that in the present there is a, a, a sense of, um, a, of the eternal that is the key to correct living and the key to... Um, and really the only reason that is worth living is to know that flavor of the eternal, which doesn't mean immortal, it's, there is a difference. So I think it's an entire civilization that really has centered the effort on that rather than remembering what has happened and what didn't happen. And you perceive that even today, you know, of course it's part of the contemporary world, but it's lived in, in with a different point of view. Okay, so we're almost out of time. There's one question back here, gentleman with a beard, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. And there is an other India which we see a little in the Shalimar the clown and, and the India which has a fair share of Hindu Talbanization. That's the hounding of FM Hussain in India and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Kashmir disappearances, raps and post Indira Gandhi uh, genocide of six. What do you think of this India? Which, you know? Which one of us? <laughs> hmm? <laughs> oh yes, uh, there is that India too, of course. Just like there is an America, you know, who does what it does. Do we have to talk about it? <laughs> I mean, I agree with you. I, I can see that. This is why I, I, I mean, I, I really don't think I'm romanticizing. I'm just talking about parts of Indian identity that I can relate to. Um, I'm as shocked and horrified as you are by all the other narratives, but those are not my narratives. I have no interest in those narratives. Let them tell their stories. We'll tell our stories. I, I have an interest in those narratives. <laughs> so I'll do that part. <laughs> um, well, listen, uh, we're, all right, there's a lady here who just said last question. Yeah, if we could just get the mic. You just get the microphone to you. I have a simple question. Um, in your travel, did you visit uh, Bengal? And if so, what do you think of the representation of uh, Durga in art and different <laughs> ways it is presented? Well, believe it or not, I've never been to Bengal, so maybe my next trip I can pay my homage to Durga. <laughs> All right. Okay, folks, thank you very much. That's a, um, thank you for your question. Thank you.